your nation uh, and to pay respect to their elderly past, present and, and emerging. Uh, and to acknowledge that uh, I'm uh, sitting in my home now on the level to the people that the authority has never been seated and to extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island people uh, who are joining us today or are going to watch this recording later on. Uh, welcome, my name is uh, Noam Perleg and I'm a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW. And I would like to welcome you all to the 10th webinar on child rights uh, that we are organizing in collaboration with the Diplomacy Training Program, Australian Lawyers of Human Rights and Youth Law Australia. And today's topic is using children's rights in practice, a view from the bar. Uh, some housekeeping rules to begin with, if you can mute your mics, but leave your cameras on so we can see and engage uh, together. Uh, this uh, webinar is recorded and uh, live streamed on social media, and the recording will be made available uh, on YouTube, uh, on the DTP YouTube channel afterwards. Um, during the coming hour, we will also uh, post links on the chat function uh, to give you some more background information and references to some of the cases and other uh, materials that we're going to hear about today. And please use the chat function uh, to make comments and to ask any questions you might have uh, to our presenter. Um, we would also like uh, to thank the Embassy of Switzerland uh, in Australia for their financial support of this, of this project. Last month, uh, in our ninth webinar, we heard from Judge uh, Tony Fitzgerald from New Zealand about the usage and often the under usage of children's rights uh, uh, discourse and language uh, uh, and law in cases that he hears in his court despite uh, having some explicit statutory provisions uh, in New Zealand that refer to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Today, we would like to continue our focus on the utility and usage of child rights uh, law and discourse, uh, and to look at uh, uh, on the litigation uh, side of things, uh, <coughs> sorry, the other side of the courtroom, and to, give, uh, and to get some practitioners' perspective. Uh, my colleague who will moderate uh, um, uh, the webinar with me today is Normie Gold, who is a senior solicitor and member of the Executive Management Committee of Australian Lawyers of Human Rights. And she takes uh, uh, the place of uh, my colleague, Dr. Faith Gordon from ANU College of Law, who usually sits in that seat, but couldn't join us uh, today. Uh, and now, uh, if, you, if you may, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our two uh, speakers for today. Each will uh, talk for about 10 to 12 minutes. That will, should leave us uh, enough time for a Q&A session. So I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome uh, Michael Stanton, who practices in criminal and administrative law and has a particular interest in the operation and effects of the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibility Act 2006 in Victoria. Michael is also a member of the National Criminal Law Committee of the Law Council of Australia. And he is joined by Catherine Brown, who is a Melbourne-based lawyer as well, and a sessional academic at Monash University. Catherine was a chair of Liberty Victoria Rights Advocacy Project. And in this role, she over, uh, sorry, oversaw a range of successful human rights-based law reform campaign. Michael and Catherine will speak for about 10 minutes, uh, and then uh, Naomi, my, my colleague, would moderate the Q&A session. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. It's uh, incredible to see so many people from uh, such a wide variety of places. Uh, Catherine and I are uh, connecting from Melbourne, and so at the outset, we'd like to pay our uh, respects uh, to the that we're presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and we acknowledge them as the tra traditional owners. Uh, we would also like to pay our respects to their elders past and present and, the, uh, and any Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. This is a wonderful opportunity to get to uh, reflect on uh, human rights advocacy in Victoria and in some respects human rights advocacy in Australia. It has been uh, 15 years since the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities was enacted. And over that time, it has resulted in some very significant victories for human rights. It has also resulted in some very significant decisions that, has, uh, that have incorporated the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, uh, Often legal practitioners, particularly in Victoria, perhaps more broadly than that, think about human rights law and think that it's a footnote, that it's uh, something that you add to the end of a submission if you're feeling adventurous, uh, that you might refer to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But the Victorian Charter and our experience of the Victorian Charter has seen that with 
enthusiasm and some creativity, uh, human rights discourse can be moved from a footnote into the uh, front and centre position when it comes to legal advocacy. And so we, we, we hope we can share some of our experiences with you all uh, as uh, human rights advocates. And, uh, and it is an exciting time uh, for human rights advocacy in Victoria. The, the Charter of Human Rights has had that period of time now to become an embedded part in some respects of the legal landscape in Victoria. So uh, it's no longer um, the new kid on the block. It is a, uh, an important part of, of the legal landscape and it is increasingly being utilised. Uh, and so we'll, we'll explore some of the examples of where the Charter has been used and how the Charter has allowed for the rights of the child and the International Convention on the Rights of the Child to be incorporated into legal um, decision-making, judicial decision-making. So uh, perhaps the best example of the uh, impact of the Charter and Human Rights jurisprudence uh, in Victoria has been the certain children litigation concerning the transfer and placement of young uh, well, children, detainees within the confines of what was an adult prison, uh, Barwon prison. And Catherine will speak to that case study uh, soon. Uh, but before we get to that, I think it's important that we uh, set out some of the foundations in relation to human rights advocacy and the Charter in Victoria, because it will inform, we hope, you all as to how the rules work. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, human rights advocacy can seem like, uh, can be uh, perhaps not founded on rules and a rules-based analysis, but when one actually takes a methodical and rules-based approach, that can often overcome the reluctance of judges, magistrates to employ the charter in their decision-making. It's not uh, as perhaps it's unfairly categorised by some an airy-fairy uh, document or, or piece of legislation that has a limited value. It is a important law that Parliament has enacted that places significant uh, obligations on decision makers in Victoria. So it is important to have some understanding of the rules-based methodology that is employed. Uh, we've prepared a paper, which hopefully you've all received, uh, and we've just, we won't go through it uh, line by line, time wouldn't allow that, but we did intend to provide a paper that would, uh, hopefully people would have a chance in their own time to read and consider, and we've attempted to provide an overview really in the body of the paper and then more detailed consideration links to resources in the footnotes so if there is an area where people where you have a particular interest hopefully there's an article or a judgment to consider and so we've also provided as appendix a to the paper uh, a list of uh, handy charter resources so that uh, people can see there are a wide array of really helpful tools that enable human rights advocacy to again take that, occupy that role at the front of litigation rather than being an afterthought. Uh, so at the outset, I, I need to explain, and I'll attempt to do so fairly briefly about how the Victorian Charter works. What is the Charter of Human Rights? How does it enable the Convention on the Rights of the Child to be utilised? Uh, in litigation and in advocacy. Uh, it's important to recognise at the outset that the charter is based on what's called the dialogue model. So it founds a discussion between different arms of government in relation to human rights law and human rights concepts. It isn't a constitutional document. So it's different, obviously, from constitutionally entrenched uh, rights instruments that can result in uh, judges invalidating uh, laws. So it doesn't allow the judiciary to 
invalidate laws. Uh, and that's very important. And that was in no small part why uh, I'm sure Parliament was willing to enact it. it. It isn't as far reaching as constitutionally entrenched protections. It is in, in one respect, it's like any law, it could be amended at any time, it could be repealed. So in that sense, it is uh, vulnerable. Um, and perhaps to some extent that reflects some of the uh, slow evolution of charter law in Victoria because uh, some decision makers perhaps wanted to enable it to become an embedded part of the legal landscape before it became too uh, dominant, dominant perhaps or uh, was at the risk of uh, repeal. So the, the human, the, the charter uh, is underpinned by that important discussion between arms of government about about the about human rights concepts, but it also has an important role, and perhaps the most important role outside of the courtroom, and that is, it enables, uh, it requires Parliament to, uh, whenever a bill is introduced, to uh, make a statement of compatibility or a statement of incompatibility, which is a statement of why a new law, proposed law, is or is not compatible with human rights. And so that is an important, um, important process in bringing human rights concepts uh, and logic to the forefront of government decision making long before you get to the courtroom and have to litigate. It, it is meant to provide a framework where the executive and decision makers in government uh, will be mindful of human rights at the outset rather than, again, it being an afterthought. Um, in our paper, we've set out, that's at paragraph 10, what we regard as the cornerstones of the Charter. And I'll attempt to share my uh, screen to you all so you can see that uh, diagram that we've uh, put in the paper. And that should be being shared now. So uh, in order to understand how the Charter works, there really are four cornerstones. And this is perhaps the four most important parts of the Charter that really give it its teeth and uh, effect. And the first cornerstone at the top left um, is what's known as the interpretive provision. And this is a provision that's about how should laws be interpreted? Uh, how should laws be read? Uh, and uh, the Charter requires that laws must be interpreted consistently with their purpose, compatibly with human rights. So that's a very important part of the Charter. It, it requires, not unlike uh, other legal interpretation principles, although there's a debate about how far reaching it, it should be, but it requires human rights uh, discourse to really enter the interpretation of laws right at the outset, uh, it should form part of the body of uh, interpretive rules when considering a particular provision. Now, there has been a lot of uh, disagreement, debate about how far that, that provision can stretch, about how far section 32, subsection 1 extends, because one can imagine that uh, if Parliament clearly in, intends a particular thing to occur because of the enactment of a provision to enable judges to reinterpret laws contrary to parliamentary intent would create um, the potential for uh, undermining the supremacy of parliament. So there's been a, in the first phase of the Charter in Victoria, there's been very big debates about how strong that interpretive provision is. But in essence, it is um, required to be considered and should be considered at the outset when interpreting statutory provisions. The other important provision, another important provision is the public authority provision, section 38, and that's at the top right of the diagram. And that's a requirement that public authorities must consider human rights and act compatibly with them unless they cannot reasonably act differently. And that's, as you can imagine, a very significant obligation that parliament has placed on public authorities. So that extends to Victoria Police, uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, uh, correctional authorities, uh, 
housing departments. It extends across the board to branches of government and it requires them to act compatibly where it's possible, where they can't act, uh, where, where they are not required to uh, only act uh, inconsistently with the Charter. It obliges them to act compatibly with human rights. And so that's a very powerful provision and it's been a significant part of the second wave of jurisprudence and laws in Victoria. So those are the two perhaps key provisions, the interpretive provision, interpreting laws, how should laws be interpreted, and the public authorities provision, how must public authorities act. Uh, the other two important things to consider about the Charter are at the bottom uh, of that diagram on the left, that the Charter does permit human rights to be subject to limits. So, uh, but those limits have to be reasonable and de demonstrably justified. So human rights can uh, be limited. Perhaps uh, a clear example of that at the moment is the right to protest in the context of COVID-19. Uh, they can be limits to rights, but they must be reasonable and demonstrably justified uh, limitations. And the last cornerstone is at the bottom right, the Supreme Court may declare that a law cannot be interpreted consistently with human rights. And again, as I said at the outset, that doesn't allow uh, judges to invalidate laws, but they can, courts can make a declaration that a law cannot be interpreted consistently with human rights. And, uh, and then if that occurs, Parliament has to uh, respond uh, in Parliament. But uh, it doesn't have to amend the law. The law continues to have operation and effect. So it doesn't undermine parliamentary sovereignty. You could see it in some respects as a, as a form of shaming mechanism in theory, that if the government wishes to continue to have a, a law on the books that is inconsistent with human rights, well, the courts will or can uh, call them out on that and, and that government will be expected to uh, respond accordingly. So those are the uh, fundamental uh, building blocks, if you like, of, of the uh, Charter of Human Rights. And as you can imagine, uh, it's been over the last 15 years, it's been quite a, a journey uh, while the courts have been exploring uh, how all those cornerstones interrelate. But what they do do is they clearly require or affect the actions of public authorities and the interpretation of laws. And so skipping perhaps to the, mo the best example of how the Charter has incorporated the rights of children into legal decision-making, uh, we should go straight to the certain children litigation because that's a very powerful example of how those perhaps difficult legal concepts are employed in practice by the courts. And so I'll turn to Kat, who will uh, who'll explain and uh, take you through that case study. Thanks, Mike. And um, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, so as Mike mentioned, I wanted to talk about um, two specific charter decisions today. And I hope to do so in a way that's going to both illustrate how the charter operates in practice um, and also draw out lessons that we can take from, from these cases and apply to other future cases, as well as other non-legal forms of advocacy. So both the decisions I'm going to talk about today, Certain Children 1 and Certain Children 2, they're both decisions of the Supreme Court of Victoria, and they both concern the rights of children in detention, and in particular, conditions in detention. The facts of the cases started in late 2016, when there were some riots at the Youth Justice Precinct in Parkville, which is a criminal justice detention centre facility for children in Melbourne. The riots um, caused damage to the buildings, which in turn led to a fairly drastic decrease in the accommodation capacity of Victoria's youth justice system. So it was pretty clear that the government was going to have to come up with another solution. They were going to need to find somewhere else to house these children. In response um, to the crisis, the government made the decision in late 2016 to basically legally, legally change a unit of Barwon Prison and to transform it into a youth justice centre. So the unit was known as the Gravillia Unit. 
Um, for anyone who might not be familiar with Bowen Prison, it's a maximum security prison in Victoria and it ordinarily houses adult male prisoners. So the government has established this guerrilla unit within that prison as a youth justice facility. And then it made a further decision to transfer some children to the unit. The children were kept separate from adult prisoners. It was a separate unit, but the conditions of the unit were conditions designed to house high security adult male prisoners. It certainly wasn't a facility that had been built or designed with children and their particular developmental and educational needs in mind. So I mentioned there were two proceedings um, and I'll, I'll explain shortly why. So the first proceeding was brought in December 2016. So some children um, brought a challenge and they were challenging the government's decisions, both to establish the centre, the unit as a youth justice centre, and also to transfer the kids there. One of the ways in which they challenged these decisions was to argue that the government hadn't properly considered their human rights when they made the decisions. So this is the obligation that Mike was referring to under Section 38.1 of the Charter. So the children made this argument in relation to three rights, the prohibition on cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, the right to humane treatment when deprived of liberty, and also the protection of the best interests of the child. In arguing their case, the plaintiffs were able to point to evidence about how the unit was operating, um, they tended evidence, for example, which suggested that the children um, were forced to spend really significant periods um, in isolation in their cells, so in solitary confinement for up to 23 hours a day. Um, they experienced fear and threats from staff, and there was an absence of, or at the least very little opportunity for, educational and other pursuits. So things like vocational training, courses, all the sorts of things you would expect children to be provided with if as a last resort, they are put in criminal justice detention. So the judge in this first proceeding, Justice Gard, ultimately agreed with the plaintiffs. He held that the government hadn't properly considered those three rights and the government had therefore breached section 38.1 of the charter. The decisions were also invalid based on other legal grounds, which we won't go into for the purposes of this seminar, but the outcome was that the court ordered that the government had to move the children to a lawfully established youth justice centre. So they had to basically properly consider and act compatibly with the children's human rights. There was an appeal of this decision by the government. It was partly successful, but it didn't change the outcome and it didn't um, deal with any of the charter grounds, so we don't need to worry about it for the purposes of this seminar. What's important to know is that in response, the government then made a new decision to re-establish the Gravilla unit as a youth justice centre and to again transfer children to the unit. Perhaps unsurprisingly, these decisions were challenged again in 2017 in the proceeding that became known as Certain Children Number 2. The plaintiffs argued the same rights had been breached and they argued that the government had failed to properly consider their rights and also that they'd acted substantively incompatibly with their rights. The judge in this case, Justice Dixon, ultimately held that the government had failed to properly consider their rights and had acted incompatibly with the rights but only the rights in relation to the best interest of the child and the right to be treated humanely when deprived of liberty. The result was that the decisions were unlawful under the Charter, and on that basis, Justice Dixon made orders declaring the decisions to be unlawful and requiring the government to stop detaining children at the Gorilla Unit. There are, I think, a number of interesting aspects of these cases and lessons we can take away from them, but I want to really focus in on two in particular. The first, and I think the most important lesson, is that the Charter and other domestic human rights instruments as well can work. It can have teeth and result in real concrete outcomes for children. 
In terms of future advocacy, there's a number of things that flow from this. First, it's a way to directly defend children's rights in court. This has another positive flow on effect as well. Through legal advocacy, we can use the courts to essentially advance rights. So through the development of precedent, the way in which courts apply and develop the law, if they're doing so in a way that's compatible with human rights and that's heading in a human rights compatible direction, that sets precedent, which then allows us to use that precedent in future cases. So essentially, the more you use the charter, often, the more useful it gets. It also has effects even when you're not in a courtroom. The very fact that the charter can be used in successful litigation makes it a much more influential tool in campaigns or stakeholder engagement with public authorities. So you can use this kind of human rights framework to be speaking not just in terms of your policy asks or wants, but also in terms of obligations. And of course, it also has obligations for government decision making. So government actors themselves um, are going to be aware of their obligations and aware of the possible consequences of those obligations, uh, possible consequences, consequences of breach of those obligations. So it's going to change the sort of um, decision making incentive structure, if you like, within government. The second lesson that I think we can take away from this case is that the charter can be a really useful way for bringing international legal standards and reasoning into Australian courtrooms. Um, so a bit of background, perhaps for those people in the room who are non-lawyers, um, Australia has what's known as a dualist system under international law. So what that means is that even once we ratify a treaty, it doesn't have force as domestic law unless if it's specifically enacted by an Australian parliament as an Australian law. So this hasn't happened with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Convention on the Rights of the Child doesn't have direct force as domestic law in Australia. But as Mike mentioned, the Charter tells courts that they can have regard to international law, international legal decisions um, when they're interpreting legislation. And that's exactly what happened in these cases. So in the first case in particular, Justice Guard was significantly influenced by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. He had regard to Article 40, which deals with how children should be treated when they're in the detention, that they need to be treated in a manner that's consistent with their sense of dignity and worth and which reinforces their respect for the human rights and fundamental freedoms of others. His Honour also had regard to the Beijing rules, that's the UN standard minimum rules for the administration of justice um, in juvenile proceedings, and also to general comments of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And he used these materials to inform the scope of the right to the protection of the best interests of the child under the Charter. Partly through these materials, he identified important principles under international law, such as, you know, the best interest of the child requires us to take into account the views of children. Um, and that when, when we're talking about the best interest of the child, we really need to be very cognizant of their developmental needs and of that child's particular developmental needs. So this main takeaway, I think, is that while there is some reluctance in Australian courts to sort of use international law and legal materials, or I shouldn't say all courts, but in a lot of courts, um, the interpretive provision in the Charter can be a really useful channel through which to make these legal materials um, more relevant and more persuasive in a courtroom than they otherwise might be. We did have a second case study, but I think in the interest of time, we'd really love to get, um, you know, comments and questions and a discussion going. I might quickly throw to Mike, though, just to introduce the sort of concept of the second case study in case if that's something people would like to discuss. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, it's in the paper, the second case study, and it's certainly, it's an example of sometimes you can raise human rights arguments and uh, often you can win the case and not even have the human rights arguments substantively dealt with. Uh, 
advocates, it's a common experience or a fairly common experience that even by raising human rights arguments through the Charter, it, it's extraordinary how often um, uh, particularly prosecutors, government uh, don't particularly want to have a human rights fight. And that can often result in a victory without the substantive issues having to be decided. So in short, the second case study was an example of where a child accused was sentenced in the children's court and it appears that no one uh, quite extraordinarily considered the issue of uh, Dolly Incapax, uh, which uh, is a presumption against, uh, a rebuttable presumption against criminal responsibility for children under the age of 14. And so it's, uh, there's been a big push, obviously, as everyone no doubt is aware, to uh, raise the age of, of criminal responsibility. Uh, but in lieu of that, without having that legislative reform, the Charter provided an avenue to incorporate the Convention on the Rights of the Child and notions of the best interests of the child to argue that that conviction should have been set aside or should be set aside because that issue, that fundamental protective principle of Dolly Incapax just wasn't considered by the court and the court had a duty to consider it. And uh, ultimately the case was decided on the basis of the evidence uh, and not on charter grounds, but uh, it's, it's not an uncommon occurrence that uh, by raising uh, a fight <laughs> in terms of human rights that uh, that decisions can, uh, as an advocate, can flow your way um, because uh, perhaps some uh, actors don't want to establish precedents and they don't want to uh, litigate and have adverse decisions. Uh, perhaps some judicial officers don't want to deal substantively with human rights jurisprudence and legislation, but it's a powerful example of how you can, um, you can use human rights advocacy and not even have to... Uh, uh, have a decision and but shape a really important um, victory for a person in moving forward with their lives that has been influenced by those human rights, I suppose. All right, well, thank you uh, so much to both Catherine and Michael for, the, for your presentations. Um, I, um, I am here from the Australian Lawyers for Human Rights and we're very proud always to co-host these events. Um, we spend our time as Australian Lawyers for Human Rights uh, as volunteers and association of lawyers trying to promote awareness of international human rights standards in Australia and sometimes those of us working in the field can despair somewhat at um, our courts and our politicians' lack of regard to those standards. So it's very inspiring to hear from both of you um, of cases where human rights legislation and in particular international human rights standards um, have been used successfully in our domestic courts, whether um, in decisions or as you spoke about, Michael, in influencing um, outcomes behind the scenes. Um, I'd like to invite anyone now who has a question to put that question into the chat room. And um, I will put your questions to Michael and Catherine, or if you have a comment on anything that was raised today. Um, I might start off by asking you both, though, um, in your view, um, what, what reforms do you think could be made to our domestic human rights charter to help, to help um, promote its use. Um, one campaign that um, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights is actively involved in is trying to have um, a complaints mechanism introduced into the ACT legislation, which would mean that um, uh, you could bring a complaint about a breach of a human right in the same way as you might bring a complaint about a discrimination complaint. So you'd make your complaint to the Human Rights Commission, there'd be a conciliation, and then um, you might be able to go on to a tribunal after that. Um, in your view, what sort, of, what sort of mechanisms might be able to help us, apart from lawyers as taking your advice and just using 
the, the charter more in their everyday practice, what changes do you think we might be able to work towards to having human rights standards and particularly the Convention of the Rights of the Child used more in our domestic legislation? Uh, thanks for that. There's, from my perspective, there are some clear reforms that could be made. Um, and there were some reforms that in Victoria were suggested or recommended in 2015 and are yet to be acted upon by government, which is very unfortunate. There's not an adequate explanation as to why uh, government hasn't made some reforms to the Charter. Uh, one, in the paper, we've set out some of what we've described as reasons for choppiness. We've used Justice Tate's language there in relation to the early years of the Charter or roadblocks to success is a term we've uh, used. And we're not, we don't have that list to discourage people from raising human rights, far, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, far, far from it. Um, but these are practical concerns and th there could be uh, legislative amendment or reforms that would uh, greatly encourage um, human rights advocacy and human rights compatible outcomes. And perhaps uh, one of the clearest examples is the notice requirement. So in Victoria, if you want to raise a human rights argument in the county court or the Supreme Court, you have to give notice to the Attorney General and the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. And one can imagine if you're a lawyer and you're briefed late in a case and uh, there's a lot of other moving parts and you know that by raising the charter that it'll have to be adjourned off and uh, who knows who. Um, you can probably, particularly in the early years of the charter, you could, when when precedent was being set, you could be assured that the Attorney General would brief Silk and Juniors and there'd be an equality of arms issue. And so uh, that notice requirement does have a, a chilling effect and that has been recommended to be uh, abolished uh, or reformed is more accurate. And so that's one practical example. Uh, another practical example is uh, clarifying some of the very unfortunate provisions, and I won't get too technical in relation to the Charter, but there's a very tortured provision in the Victorian Charter in called the Remedies Provision, Section 39, and it requires taking Charter action to be tied to a non-Charter course of action. And it, it's, it's unfortunately drafted, and it means that uh, that itself has a chilling effect. Uh, the other chilling effect although this wasn't uh, recommended uh, as a reform uh, in the 2015 review, is that there's no uh, damages for breach of the Charter. Now, uh, that's uh, different to other jurisdictions where there can at least be some form of nominal damages uh, or that to indicate the, the breach of human rights, and that would perhaps encourage the Charter to be raised. Uh, there's other issues, technical issues, about whether a breach of the obligations in the Charter can are a jurisdictional error, and that raises technical issues. Um, but the, perhaps the biggest obstacle at this stage, or a real obstacle as well, is the key judgment in Australia uh, in terms of human rights instruments is the judgment of Momsilovic. And I won't uh, <laughs> trouble you all by going into it now. There's a table, uh, an extra B in, in their paper, which sets out the different reasons uh, for judgment uh, in that case, but uh, that is an incredibly complex judgment and uh, and it's daunting uh, to a human rights advocate who wants to take the best interests of the child from the uh, from the convention and inform, use it in through through the interpretive provision and use it in a straightforward way. You've got this massive <laughs> high court judgment with separate reasons for judgment and separate methodological issues and. Um, so that's, that's a bit unfortunate. And obviously that's not going to change until there's another case that goes to the High Court and perhaps there's a bit more clarity. So um, that's the, th those are some real issues that I think uh, uh, that could, a lot of those issues could be addressed by Parliament. Some might need to be addressed by litigation. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. And oh, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, sorry. I was just say, I'm happy to jump in and say I think the um, idea of a complaints mechanism could be a really good one. Um, often the downside to complaint mechanisms is that they don't have this sort of precedent creating quality and the decisions aren't always binding and don't result in any sort of concrete legal 
remedy. Um, at the same time, as much as we say, you know, encourage you to be bold and use the charter and litigation, um, that obviously either costs a lot of money or involves some pretty significant pro bono legal support, which isn't always going to be easy to come across. So I think anything that can make um, use of the charter more accessible to more people is a really good thing. Um, in terms of not so much a legal reform, but just other ways of doing things, I think just increasing education and awareness about charter rights, not just among lawyers, but also among um, you know, public servants who are making decisions that affect people's lives um, would be a really great way forward in terms of um, making it more accessible to be able to use, even if not in litigation, in, you know, conversations with government decision makers um, when your rights are affected. Thanks, Catherine. That answers one of the questions that popped up about whether there is any education or training for judicial officers and other types of public servants on their human rights obligations. I'm not sure if either of you are in a position to answer that, um, but it does sound like that there's a, that's an area that could be worked on. Um, yeah, I, I just might um, jump in quickly to say in terms hmm. of judicial education, there is a great resource um, called the Judicial College of Victoria. Um, they publish information for judges and for the community at large, and they do have pretty significant collection of charter materials, including case notes um, and a bench book, which explains how the charter works. So if anyone after this session wants to educate themselves, that's a great place to start. Great. Um, so we have a, um, a question from Patrick. Um, in other jurisdictions, we've seen lawyers and judges introducing the general comments of UN treaty bodies into litigation and judgments. Do you think that the Charter of Human Rights and other human rights legislation is encouraging that to happen more here in Australia? I think we heard a bit of that from you already, but I don't know if you've got anything additional to add. Uh, it certainly does permit that and I think has encouraged it. Whether or not enough advocates are taking up the, the mantle is a different issue, but certainly the mechanisms there. And in the paper, we've set out section 32, subsection two of the charter, which expressly uh, enables um, decision makers to have regard to international law and uh, general comments have been, uh, have informed the application of section 32. And that happened in, um, in the certain children litigation. Um, it's happened in other litigation. There's two examples in the paper of Justice Bell uh, making decisions about how to treat an, a child accused in the courtroom during proceedings that couldn't be heard in the children's court because they were effectively too serious. And his honour, who has been a real champion of, of human rights uh, and has led really um, the, the charter jurisprudence from the, from the bench, uh, he, his honour did use comments, the convention to inform what, what, what is best practice for how to treat a child accused uh, in the courtroom. So uh, not robing, sitting uh, on the same level, uh, refer using first names, uh, not handcuffing, uh, keeping the child away from adult prisoners or separate. So all of those things. And it, and 32, subsection two of the charter allows that. It's a, and, and parliament, um, often some conservative, perhaps jurists say, well, this is all human rights and it's, you know, we're about the will of parliament primarily and not the international law. And that's, you know, um, that's a separate issue and not really what we're concerned about. Well, the charter is an expression of parliamentary will. And that's really important to remember and put at the forefront. That this is what parliament is saying should inform the interpretation of laws or actions by public authorities. And it is an expression of parliamentary supremacy. So in that sense, it should be at the forefront. Great. Um, we have a question from Linda. Um, in all states and territories, the use of physical force against children is lawful and defendable under certain circumstances um, generally or, um, or chastisement and done by a parent. The, the Convention on the Rights of the Child promises all children are childhood free from violence. 
And repeatedly, the um, UN committee has called on Australia to repeal the Defence and Criminal Codes in Australia. In Australia, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is most often used for a range of quite specific cases. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can propel a better understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child for children more generally? Kat, do you have any thoughts about um, that? Yeah. I think seminars like this are a great place to start. Yeah. I think um, in terms of, I suppose, if we're thinking about raising understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the rights that it protects, um, the important things to think about are who do we need to target with that level of understanding? So is it judicial officers? Is it public servants who are making decisions that affect children's rights? Um, or is it... Um, you know, community legal centres, for example, who are going to be representing people? I think the answer is it's probably all of those. And the best way to raise awareness is to really target um, the education in ways that is going to be useful for people in their occupations and that they're going to be able to draw on. Um, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add or that you've seen in your experience? It, it will gather its own momentum. And I think the more it's used, the more people will see value in human rights advocacy and the more that will lead to, at least from a, this is from, from the bar, the, the perspective from the bar, pragmatically, I think the more wins there are, the more people will see how human rights can be used and the more people will want to educate themselves and recognise that, um, that to properly present a case for their client whether it's a civil or a criminal case, then in many cases they should be framing submissions in terms of human rights. And it shouldn't just be an adventurous test case kind of dynamic. It should become part of the landscape. And as it becomes normalised, uh, I expect, or more normalised, I expect people will want to familiarise themselves more with the various conventions and, um, and rights. Thank you. Our next question comes from Justice Nelson, um, asking, are there any moves towards a federal charter or Bill of Rights in Australia? I'll just quickly jump in to say that that is one of um, uh, the campaigns that Australian Lawyers for Human Rights are working on at the moment, and I'm the chair of the Human Rights Act Committee, um, and along with various other um, non-profit organisations, that campaign is active. That doesn't mean we're um, anywhere close to it happening. Um, but I think um, spinning off from that question, perhaps our speakers might have some comments about any lessons we might learn from working with the Victorian Charter in um, advocating for or developing a federal charter of human rights. The from my perspective, the issue with the Federal Charter of Human Rights is that you have to confront the argument head on that charters of rights are undemocratic and you have to confront what, in my view, is a caricature uh, argument that, um, that, it can, that charters of rights confer too much power to judges and that by doing so and by allowing judges to reinterpret laws, that's itself undemocratic. And... Uh, and unfortunately, there's been quite a number of people who are willing to, from all sides of politics, uh, who are willing to uh, echo that line without actually looking at how careful and rules-based uh, human rights jurisprudence is. I, I mean, if you look at Justice Bell's judgments, I mean, this isn't a... This isn't a reverse engineering and an ultimate decision. Um, to using human rights to just get to the end point that you want. It's a careful rules-based approach. And there's clear authority now, obviously, in comparable jurisdictions, uh, be it New Zealand, be it the United Kingdom, be it South Africa, about how you can use Canada, about how you can use human rights instruments responsibly. And, and of course, as I was saying before, that it is an expression of parliamentary intent. Um, and if parliament wants human rights to be at the forefront, as I think most of us here would think that it should, then a, a charter is a way that that can be achieved um, and that as a, as a manifestation of parliamentary intent. So it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't undermine 
um, parliamentary supremacy. It's a, it's a manifestation of it. And I think trying to break that down in an accessible way for people, for the general public to understand, and also perhaps remedying this idea that it's just a lawyer's picnic, uh, because that's another unfortunate caricature that I, I think uh, it's, it's too easy for critics of the federal charter to bring an argument up and say, you know, as they are with a, a federal uh, anti-corruption commission. I mean, that, oh, it's just the lawyers that want this. Well, no, uh, we're signatories to important human rights instruments and this is important um, in order to improve our democracy. And, uh, and, you know, and a lot of cases demonstrate it's not a lawyer's picnic at all. I mean, the key case is most of the work's done pro bono. It's about people that genuinely want to improve the quality of human rights in Australia. And uh, perhaps examples like certain children can be leveraged federally because despite perhaps some people not being very sympathetic to prisoners generally, when it's children who are being, um, you know, put into adult prisons with, you know, guards using dogs and pepper spray and, uh, and they're in solitary for 23 hours a day, I would hope, I, I would hope that the general public might say, well, hang on, there is a role here for human rights at a federal level. And I also think people don't know how few rights are protected by the Australian constitution. I think most, a lot of Australians think, um, you know, there's an Americanization perhaps of, of an understanding of, of our constitution and they assume that there are constitutional um, safeguards and they're just not there. So I think exposing that or raising awareness about that is really important. I don't know, Catherine, if you had comments yet. Just one quick thing to add. Um, I think the, the Victorian Charter certainly isn't a perfect document, but one thing the Victorian government did relatively well in um, the sort of initial processes of before we actually had the Charter was consulting quite widely. And I think that, you know, if we do manage to get to the point politically where we're looking at potentially having a charter, that's a lesson, lesson that can be drawn from it, that there's a lot to be gained from speaking really widely and also in depth to people who use the charter in their jobs, both on the side of government and also community legal centres, and also speaking to people whose lives are going to be affected by the rights protected in the charter and finding out, you know, what matters to them? Um, are there things that are missing from the existing sort of patchwork of um, human rights legislation federally? And are there things that are missing as well from state and territory-based charters? So I think that's another potential lesson moving forward. Thank you. We um, are getting very close to the end and there's a few more questions. So I'll just go to the next one. Um, that's that's popped up in the chat and that's from Andrea. Um, it's it's just a question of whether there are provisions within the in the um, Convention of the Rights of the Child that relate to equal access to services for all children. In other words, are there provisions that could support arguments to enable equal access for children with disabilities, vulnerable children, um, access to government funded educational services? So I guess um, I guess the question is um, asking about opportunities for using um, the charter and the convention in 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 that particular way. Um, there, there is so Article Two of on, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, I don't have the exact wording in front of me, but it's essentially a non discrimination clause, and that non discrimination clause explicitly refers to disability. Um, bringing that into the charter, and this might be something that Mike have, might have a bit more direct experience on, um, but the charter rights also apply without discrimination. Um, and that's discrimination. I think when they say discrimination, they mean um, discrimination as it means under the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria. And that certainly covers disability as a protected attribute. But Mike, I'm not sure if you have anything further to add to that. No, that's, that's my understanding that Section 8 of the Charter is the equality right and um, age is a protected attribute. And so you can use uh, Section 8 of the Charter, but also, uh, as Catherine pointed out, Article 2 of the Convention. So it could, in, it could inform the interpretation of a statutory provision through the interpretive provision um, and uh, through Section 32, subsection 2, incorporating or bringing in Article 2 of the 
proc or just the application of uh, of uh, section um, eight of the charter. So, yeah. So the, it is those are protected rights. I, I think we've run out of time for the remaining questions that are in the chat room. But, Catherine, I did want to give you the opportunity to, to make your um, a couple of comments you, um, about the another future opportunity, and that is in relation to um, the rights of the children and, and climate change and whether what opportunities you feel um, them might arise in the future in in this space yeah sure so i think this was something we sort of briefly adverted to towards the end of our paper as a potential um, future direction or future opportunity for using the charter to protect children's rights um, so we're seeing at the moment under international law some fairly significant developments in relation to how the law responds to climate change um, and they're Committee on the Rights of the Child in particular has recently said that they're going to commit to introducing a um, general comment on um, sort of, I think, broadly speaking, the environment and children's rights, but with a particular focus on climate change. So taking into account, for example, the fact that climate change is going to have pretty significantly um, disparate impact on the life of children going forward compared to those of us who are already a bit older. Um, so it, I think that's a real opportunity for charter litigation in the sense that once we see international law start to develop in a particular direction, um, Section 32 of the Charter, the interpretive provision, allows us to kind of almost piggyback onto that and bring those arguments into Australian courtrooms as well. So I think, um, you know, there are many exciting future directions, but I think um, children's rights and climate change is certainly up there. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to both of you. I'll um, switch back to um, Noam now to finish us up and give us um, some outline of what's going to happen next in the series. Thank you very much, Naomi, for that. And thank you very much, Catherine and Michael, for this uh, fantastic and very interesting uh, presentation and your engagement with the question. Uh, it's great to see that the chat function is populated with lots of more questions. Uh, uh, so you're all welcome to join us in our next webinars when some of those questions uh, will be answered. Um, we had two webinars about uh, children's rights and climate change. You can find both of them uh, at our DPT YouTube channel. Uh, one with one, uh, the second one was uh, uh, where we hosted the chairperson of the UN Committee on the Right of the Child that was dedicated uh, to the future general comment on children and climate change. Uh, so some development uh, in this space uh, are expected. The committee also made a decision last week about uh, individual communication concerning uh, children and climate change. Uh, unfortunately, it was uh, uh, dismissed on the ground of, the, of admissibility, but the committee did make some uh, very important decisions um, uh, yeah, suggestions and decisions with respect to the utility of the convention in the space of intergenerational justice uh, and climate change, uh, climate change as well. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us in, the, in November for our next uh, webinar in the series, which will be dedicated to child removal and child rights here in Australia. Uh, links uh, and details for that will be sent all of you in due course. Uh, I wish to thank again for the DTP, especially Andrew Frankovich and Claire Sidotti, who made this uh, uh, webinar available, and to our partnership with Youth Law Australia and with Australian Lawyers of Human Rights. Uh, stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you very much.